Welcome, Free Ride family, to the Free Ride World Tour podcast for the 2023 season. Presented by Peak Performance, the official ski wear partner of the Free Ride World Tour, and Free Ride World Tour sponsor, Vibram, we give you confidence in every step on all terrain. And I'm Mark Warner, your host, so let's drop in. Welcome back, everybody, to the Free Ride World Tour. Derek and I are on opposite ends of the planet today, but through the wonders of technology, we're looking at each other and we are still able to talk about the Free Ride World Tour 2023 with Feberbrun going down just a matter of days ago. Hello, Derek, man. Nice to see you, my man. What's up, Mark? I'm already in Verbier. We've relocated, ready for the next one. But yeah, it was uh, whew, quite a show. Quite a show it, the old uh, the old riders put on there for us. So I was here in uh, Whistler, uh, British Columbia, watching online. Um, and we actually had a challenger event. I was lucky enough to time it. So if I couldn't be in Feberbrunn, I was in Whistler for, uh, the region two, the America's challenger, the very first challenger event on diamond bowl in Whistler, BC. Uh, the first time we've had an adult, uh, free ride competition in Whistler since 20, uh, 2006. So it was really cool to see that back here, especially in the, uh, in the backyard, and uh, I got to announce that event, and uh, it was crazy. Uh, really, really exciting to watch. <laughs> um, but I realized that the, the the amount of people in the field, the amount of skiers and riders in the field was huge. So it was a long day, but it was an exciting day. Yeah, the Challenger riders are hungry. You know, they're young. They're, they're desperate for that spot on the Free Ride World Tour. So we had a similar thing going on here where both Jasna in Slovakia and Obergurgel have already been cancelled on the Challenger Tour in Region 1. And we uh, we were able to put a Challenger right at the back of the Freeride World Tour event. So the last World Tour rider dropped. Uh, they changed the banners and, and brought in a second panel of judges. And boom, we were off to the races again for Challengers. And holy... I mean, for them to get to, to ride the same exact face directly after the tour athletes do it, um, definitely some some big shoes to step into. But I'd say, at least over here, and I saw the stream coming out of the Whistler event. It was great. We had the whole tour uh, in the hotel lobby watching. The level on the Challenger Tour is just is so good. They're, they're so, like, they're so polished. I mean, we saw tour standouts, um, you know, taking podiums all over the place he, over in Fieberbrunn at Belmoga, you know, he's beloved on the free ride world tour ski men's field took the win here. And I mean, oh, in Whistler, it was basically the same. Hey, yeah, we had, uh, you know, Jackson Bathgate Bathgate isn't a name that is foreign to the, to the free ride world tour or the, or the qualifiers or the junior tours, Jackson and his brother Cooper, uh, have been, uh, working their way through this, I guess, free ride free ride journey for quite a few years. Uh, Leif Mumma came down from the tour. He ended up in second place skiing a line that I don't think has ever been skied in Whistler before. We talked about this. There's, there's a, there's a cliff face in Whistler where you kind of traverse across to get from one side to another. And I don't think I've ever seen tracks in there. I don't think I've ever seen anybody ski that before. And he aired about 40 feet, maybe more to a tiny little pinpoint landing ended up putting his knee off his face but he would never have known unless he told you uh bonkers it's it's wild that living and skiing in in Whistler for so long never having seen it it takes a bunch of people that don't know that they're not supposed to ski that to ski it yeah yeah it was it was cool and great to get these challenger events off and and get those get those riders the finishes that they need. So both sides, both uh, regions just firing right now with uh, young, up-and-coming, and and very hungry, hopefully tour-bound riders. Yeah, another uh, another couple uh, notables is uh, Wei Tian Ho had a good run. He's been, I guess, the unofficial forerunner for a few events that we've had thus far last year and this year, also out of of, of Whistler, who's a good friend of uh, Marcus Gogan. And uh, Tom Piper uh, just missed the the top three spot. He came in fourth in Whistler as well. 
Um, so he's working his way back onto the tour uh, as well. So uh, exciting stuff here from Whistler, that's for sure. Yeah, and over here we saw Sibylle Blanchon really uh, make a strong case to get herself back on the tour. So far she's got a first and a second in the two Challenger events that have run in Region 1, so definitely looking good for Sibylle. Um, you know, there are some... There are some crazy ways it could go where right now, like she and Astrid Shalus both have uh, have a first um, and and there's there's like a possibility that between them and, and Mia McNabb, there could be a three way tie for that top spot if all three of them each get a first and a second and a crash. But, uh, you know, hopefully Sabil's not going to crash, or at least hopefully for her. So it's not going to not going to have to worry about it. But I would hope in that case they just take them all. Right, and another familiar name to the tour, Zuzana Wittich. She's actually sitting in third overall uh, for that qualifier line, uh, under that qualifier line. So she's right there in the mix as well. So it's kind of like a four-way battle for those two spots uh, for the um, Challenger Europe uh, Region 1 zone for the ski women. Yeah, pretty exciting to see it all kind of, I don't know, playing out the way the 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 structure series structure designers hoped it would you know it's exciting we're seeing the strong and consistent riders kind of sitting on top of the of the standings and and that's what everybody wants oh absolutely it's it's engaged me a lot more as well you know the they've been able to not only step it up in competition but also access to those to that level of riding up until last year didn't really hear a lot or get to see a lot about about those events. I know you did because you're involved with it, but it's kind of hard to – every once in a while you get a little bit of news, but now it's become a little bit more uh, visible, which is really, really cool, which I only think is going to help grow the sport. Yeah, 100%. I agree. Uh, so, man, Fieberbrun was a time. <laughs> we, we waited and we waited and we waited – uh, definitely prove the concept of the weather window when we got there. Like, I don't like to throw around the term unskiable, but it was rough, rough, rough as guts. And then it rained. Well, first it got really sunny and then everything melted and, you know, slush balls were rolling down all over the place. Um, and then it pretty much just closed out for like four days and some of it was rain and some of it was snow, but we didn't know because it was full, full fog. And when we got back up, the day before the comp and it did it kind of opened up or the day before the last possible day of the window. Um, it looked like a brand new mountain. And and that's what you guys saw when you watched the the broadcast and on that morning, um, we did have to drop the second run in order to fit that challenger comp in there in the same day. Um, you know, the riders kind of had a, a good chat about it uh, with the organizers and, and everybody was on board to get the challengers a finish and and if it meant losing a, a second run, um, at least I didn't hear any any of the riders that were like super against that. It seemed like they all came from that place. They know exactly what it means to be able to get get that result or not. So they were pretty on board with kind of the solidarity of of free ride and making sure that that challenger event happened right after theirs, which was sick. Right. So for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with what we're talking about, um, the so with the five events. Uh, Bakira, Barret, Andorra, Ar- uh, Ordina, Arcalis, and then Kicking Horse in Golden BC are the first three events. And then there was a cut, and a lot of the riders got sent down to the Challenger Zone. And in the finals in Fieberbrunn, which they started last year, there is a two-run format, and you basically pick your best run out of the two. So the riders actually get to go two laps. Uh, so we kind of just reverted back to the old way so they could fit the Challenger event in. And uh, from the live stream, face looked good. They were yeah. like, pow. They were skiing pow. Yeah, and you know what? It it really seemed, we saw this in Kicking Horse, and I think we saw it again. I mean, it's a big face, and the conditions were good, but the Feverbrun face, the Vilti Loader, took a lot of names, you know? It was it was taking prisoners. So many crashes um, in the field from from top to bottom. Uh, snowboard men, I'd say, was the category that was the the least affected, maybe. Um, but holy, I think over fifty percent of the ski men, yeah, uh, went down. Yeah, and and a couple of them were were pretty hectic. I mean, Simon Paradon, big fall, ended up breaking his nose, um, and then we got to talk about Elizabeth Gerritsen. I mean, that was that was terrifying. Went into the eagle, was trying to do a double out of there rather than the the mega send, you know, the the Carl Christopher Reiner style. Um, 
little too fast, caught a rock trying to slow down on that on that elevated pad and ended up falling off it and falling for a long, long, long way. It was very scary, but she's fine. She has a, she has a bruise on her leg. And I think maybe the mental side of it is going to be the hardest thing to recover from. Cause that, that looked like it was real scary to, to, to live through. It was scary enough to watch. I can only imagine doing it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, especially sitting here on my couch and you know, you can't, even if you're there, you feel like you could maybe do something because you're there, but watching it on TV, I think it's almost even worse. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we had the same experience in the broadcast tent, you know, every, everybody was just holding their breath and, and she was kind of moving down, like down and down and down with the slough that she, she broke off. But, um, pretty much as soon as the guide got to her, she was sitting up and talking and then, you know, slowly as the adrenaline started to wear out, realized like, I think I'm good, which she was, she was pretty pumped that, that she got away with that one. Um, as, as not the only one. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Definitely, definitely not the only one. Um, so to be on, and based on what we were talking about with everybody crashing, maybe it was wise that there was only one run. Yeah, maybe, maybe if, uh, you know, if people had gone back for another one, we would have saw a lot more of those, those big spills. I mean, that face is big and gnarly. And there's some there's some serious spill zones because it stays deep for a long time until it really, you know, bellies out in that area between the two the two sections. There there were a lot of fairly I'd say conservative runs this year. We didn't really see the big epic airs like we usually do on the Vilsu loader, and a lot of funny little things were taking people out, um, like that one little little backflip back flip spot over on skiers skiers right area um the little wind lip after the hoizo cliff didn't really seem to be on this year only a couple people were able to figure that one out which is usually hoizel straight over to the that little wind lip it's usually backflip central and i think only a couple people really were able to time it right yeah, exactly. And then even the cliff below that, like a bunch of people went down on that one. We saw Carl go down on a flip and, and Hitzig with a back slap, which is, you know, pretty unusual. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely like, it's a lower tide year in, in Austria and, and really across the Alps. And I think a lot of those landings just hadn't filled up the same way where a ramp of snow would build up underneath the, underneath the cliff face. So everything was a little flatter than usual. Um, yeah, it's 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 a tough game and it was definitely like for how good it looked, it proved to be pretty difficult to ride well. Right. All right, well let's get into some of these categories. Why don't we do it in order of the day and start off with snowboard men and Ludo Giodiat kicking things off. He's Mr. Consistency this year. He is having himself a season. Yeah, his run was sick and and you know, he hit a, he hit so many features. He had that huge traverse in the middle, um, where he went all the way from, from riders left to riders right, but totally, you know, with, with the fluidity category, uh, you're, you're not going to be docked for traversing if you're traversing to go do something. Uh, and he definitely did like, he still hit three more airs after that long traverse, but it, um, it was, yeah, he, he packed it, absolutely packed it with features and, and cliffs and drops and never put a hair out of place. And I can't remember the judges throwing an 87-something at a first run in a really long time. I mean, they, 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 were, they were rewarding that, that, that approach, and it was cool. It was cool to see. And then John Powell came right after him, and boom. I mean, that was, that was spectacular. That was one of the highlights of, of the comp for me is that massive cross court transition that transfer that he did over the gap like so smooth he's as i think we've mentioned it before he's a snowboarder that skis in that same kind of east to west style that say an andrew pollard does on skis or or drew tabke sort of thing he's got that same sort of riding aesthetic in my opinion yeah i agree sammy luke he was like that as well and and john powell's holding it down for the for the cross (laughs) the cross court aficionados um he, he it was just so smooth he ended up winning himself a nice silver mug for the peak performance radical moment of the day for that move um and it was not only was it sick he did it perfectly like the tail of his board just caught the knuckle so it laid his board right down into the transition and it was like a, a ideal reconnection it was it was so sick 
and uh, definitely got Anna, Anna and I hyped up. And I know uh, the people who who vote on that radical moment definitely got pretty fired up too because they were they were unanimous on that one. So uh, third place uh, of the day. So he actually ended up with a ninety point six seven directly after Ludo's run. So starting the comp off with a bang. And then we have Liam Rivera, who ended up in third place with an 85-3-3 with another solid run. Uh, in his rookie season, he is basically proved he's here to stay. He belongs here. Man, Liam's run was so sick. Like that backflip he did at the top off the jump, you said it earlier, that took down so many, so many good riders. And he was perfect on it. I think, I think he found the, the right distance. There were a few who were a little short and a few who were a little long. Um, but I think he found exactly the right distance and maybe there weren't so many bomb holes when he went, um, as well. Cause you know, we saw Ryan Walkendorfer try to do the same thing right after, um, and go too far and blow up. Uh, but uh, I mean, Liam, yeah, he's, he's riding like a veteran, you know, he's a rookie on tour. He's a young guy, but he is riding like he's been doing this for a long time at the tour level. And while he's been doing it for a while in the qualifiers and the juniors, this is a different thing with the pressure and the filmers and, all of it out there and sitting on your shoulders. Plus the first guy to do it for Mexico. So he's carrying the whole weight of a nation. Um, but he's just nailing it. Yo, absolutely. And I really, I was telling you, I think we said about this last time, talked about this last time and I was telling his dad, I'm like, you need to start sending some press releases to Mexican news outlets. Cause you got to milk that. You absolutely need to milk that. You are the only Mexican writer for your nation who is absolutely killing it. I want, I want him to get what he deserves, right? Yeah. Take it, take advantage of what you can do, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I think I think that would be so cool to see that in the in the media in Mexico. Um, his his mental game, I think, is maybe what's getting him getting him where he's at. He's so strong mentally. He's not letting the stuff get to him. He's not focusing on results. He's just focusing on putting together a run and then executing that run. Let the rest of it take care of itself. But for for someone as young as he is, I give him a lot of credit for being, you know, really having his head screwed on because he's he's very um, he's very methodical with his approach. You know, he talks through he's he's talked to me a, a bunch about the lines and and his thought process going into it. And he seems like he's way more mature uh, than your typical twenty three year old, which is is very cool to see. And I I love to see that that is paying off for him in in just killer results. So those three that we just mentioned, Ludo Giudia, Jonathan Penfield, and Liam Rivera, also happen to be in the top three spots in the rankings, the overall rankings, moving into the final, the Verbier Extreme, this coming week uh, on the Beck de Ross. And uh, Ludo and Jonathan Penfield are actually quite close. I think only 1,100 points separate them. And Liam Rivera is at 24,400. So really only 3,600 points separating Ludo and Liam. With 12,000 points for a win uh, in these finals events, it's, it's not tied, but it's pretty close. I believe it's 12,000 for first, 10,000 for second, and 8,000 points for third place. So I know in the past, we haven't really had the best track record with our own personal math skills. So I'm not going to make any calls right now about who needs to do what. But from the way I see things, it's wide open. Any of them could take that title. Yeah, I agree. I think I think that's a safe bet to make. Uh, it's it's pretty open, and if somebody has if somebody has a day on the back, uh, they're gonna they're gonna be in a good position to take that title. Awesome. Uh, so that's snowboard men. Moving on to snowboard women. We don't really need to do any math because Katie Anderson not only took the event win, but she also took the overall title in convincing fashion. So congrats to Katie Anderson uh, on another really, really good day. Yeah, what a boss. I mean, she had, she knew, and she was trying not to think about it uh, at, at all, but for sure those thoughts creep in. She knew if she won this comp, she she becomes world champion. Um, and so just leaning into that pressure and, and still delivering clearly the run of the day. Uh, it was, it was awesome. Katie's just, she is on this year and, and the, the, you know, she didn't have 
a good result at Kicking Horse and her crashes were just weird and almost seemed like distracted. Um, but she, to bounce back from that and, and take the title with an event in your pocket, like she, I mean, she doesn't have to even compete in Verbier and she's already champ. Of course she's going to, uh, because she's K- Katie. And it's the Verbier extreme. It's the Beck. Like that's almost as, uh, prestigious as winning the tour itself. So I actually had a little chat with Katie not long after the event. Uh, we had her on the show earlier this year and we wanted to follow up with the newly minted champion. We spoke a little bit about her run in kicking horse and kind of what, 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 what happened there. Uh, but we also talk about, you know, her mindset and uh, where she is with this win now. So I would like to introduce everyone to the 2023 Freeride World Tour Snowboard Women Champion. And she did it with an entire event left to go still. Congratulations and welcome back to the podcast, Katie Anderson. (laughs) Thanks, Mark, and thanks for having me. Thanks for stopping by. I know you've got uh, a big party and some celebration to do. Were you, did you expect that you would be the champion of the season before the last event even went down? I think at the start of the season, I wouldn't have expected it. Um, But people kept bringing it up at this event, so I definitely thought about it. And uh, yeah, didn't know if I could pull it off, but here we are. So we've spoken once before on the podcast this season following your event win in Andorra. And I was asking you about whether you were going to take your foot off the gas or you were going to put it to the pedal. Well, you've kind of proved that full gas from Katie Anderson. Uh, You have three first place finishes, which is where you ended up now, which is why you are where you are. Um, But what happened in Kicking Horse? I wanted a quick. I wanted to ask you about that one. So that was your only fifth place event, and that was the event after I'd asked you if you're going to put your foot on the gas or not. (laughs) Honestly, for kicking horse, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, Took a little tumble on the ridge that was unexpected. And um, I don't know, it didn't really throw me off for my main line. But then once I got in the face, I kind of just had a little sit down, landed in someone's bomb hole. So (laughs) Do do you think it may have been a little bit of the extra pressure as your hometown event? You had family, you had friends there, you know, you were pretty comfortable to make the cut with the, with those uh, other two first place finishes. Do you think a lot of that had to do with it? Yeah, I think I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, Lots of people were like, Oh, you have no pressure now, but I definitely wanted to win. Like my parents were there and my dad was there and my uncle and, I wanted to do well, so yeah. So a little bit of extra pressure there. Moving into this event, following a, a kicking horse, where you, like you said, you put your put your butt down. Now moving into this one, was the pressure off because you weren't in front of family and friends? Like what what was it that made you kind of go back to your own form here in Feverbrun? Um, I'm not sure really. <laughs> I. I think I was mentally really prepared and kind of knew what I had to do. And uh, I've had a lot of talks with other riders, um, lots of like the ski men about strategies, maybe not strategies, but just like, uh, like I want to be able to prove what I can do on a snowboard, but you don't always need to go 100% in competition. You sometimes have to maybe go... 80% or or pick a a line that you know you can ride really well and that's not outside your comfort zone and that's kind of what I did here I think I think that's a good a good choice because watching a lot of people crash today at this event and I think a lot of it is because they're going 100% 100% with a little extra where you know you keep a a conservative but still very very uh, efficient line uh tends to work out a lot more often than you may think. I was talking to Andrew and we called it the, the tortoise and the hare syndrome. Yeah, a Paul's exactly who I was talking to about it. I, yeah, he definitely inspires me a lot and I think he's a, a very smart competitor as well as a rowdy skier, but you see, we saw it pay off for him today. It was awesome. 
So tell me a little bit about your run today. It, it looked like like you were just cruising almost like a free ride line like you would have back at Fernie. Like you were shredding pow in the sunshine and you looked <laughs> smooth and in control the whole way. Yeah, it was lots of fun. The pow was good. I kept like white rooming myself like on the takeoff <laughs> in the little shoot. I was like, oh man, I really I can't see right now. That was not smart. <laughs> But. Can you walk us through through your route? Was it exactly how you envisioned it? Did you end up finding something new? Did you improvise at all? Yeah, I was pretty much how I guess I followed the general area I wanted to go and then kind of improvised on the way. I yeah, was considering hitting the the top hit that a lot of skiers did and like Hold and backflip did, Liam did, and a bunch of people hit, and I knew that wasn't smart, <laughs> but as I was riding up, I was like, should I? Maybe? No. <laughs> it, it, it had about a 50-50 success rate, that, that little, that little uh, ramp today. Yeah, knowing that the landing was firm, I was kind of, in the last, as I was riding up, I was like, no, I'm going to hit some uh, much smaller features, and cruising the pow um yeah skipped some other features and i don't know in the end it worked out <laughs> uh so katie had a good run obviously with a 70.67 but just on her heels a name we're all familiar with manuela mandel who was on the tour this year but had to step aside due to an injury uh, but got wild carded because she has recovered enough. She came in and she was just behind Katie with a 69.33 with another spectacular run in her home country. Yeah, right in her backyard. Manu, you know, I got to chat with her in Kapil, uh for the World Junior Champ. She was there as a judge and she was she was really adamant that she wasn't going to come back to competition until she was 100%. She didn't want to make it worse. She's been dealing with this ankle thing for w- way too long. Um, so she was really keen to be fully back before she took a swing at it. And I think she proved that. I mean, Manuela is, she's such a good competitor. Um, she's serious when she needs to be serious, but she's fun when it's, when it's time to be fun, but her riding just kind of speaks for herself. And it was cool to see after a pretty long hiatus from full Manuela to see her back like firing and and for her to do it at home. I mean, the crowd was loving it. It was, she loved it. It's, it's the same as the Canadian riders in, in kicking horse and the Spaniards in, in Bakira. It, it just feels good to be in front of that home crowd. And, and she definitely gave them a show. And as we saw last year and everywhere, she belongs there. So it's good to have her back on the tour. Absolutely. And uh, see what she can do for next year and create a little bit more competition in, in snowboard women. Well, yeah, if, if Manuela Mandel's in the field, then it's competitive, that's for sure. Um, I want to give a bit of a special shout-out to Estelle Rosolio for just going absolutely huge. Uh, yeah. She did not stick her run, but I think she won a lot of hearts in that comp because that roller roller thing at the bottom, was uh, it was tricky to figure out the speed, and she just went fifth gear wide open right off the end of it and traveled so far in the air. Uh, and, and I just love it. I love the spirit of the, of the just absolute full send. That was so sick. So big ups to Estelle for that. Cause it was really cool. Yeah, absolutely. I had, uh, I had a, a star again next to her name watching the comp just to, to make sure I remember certain specific things. And if you need to go back and understand what we we're talking about or want to see some of the things that we we're talking about, you can do so at the free ride world tour.com fever run replay. Uh, so you can see the entire event again. You can go straight to some of the highlights. You can click on each individual rider's runs. Uh, great thing with uh, Estelle, when she got through, she ended up getting stuck on the flat and had to walk through the into the corral, and all the riders ran out to see her just because they were so pumped on the run that she threw down. So Yeah, and that just gets you so pumped when you see your friend out there just giving her like full, full throttle. Um, it makes everybody excited, and... This is a competition, but it's also a show, and everybody wants to show the best they can do for that show. And Estelle definitely did that. She, like I said, she won a lot of hearts uh, out there on the face. She had a 360 in her run as well. 
Um, so yeah, looking forward to more from Estelle, you know, we come into, we come into Verbier, the face gets bigger. She's comfortable, really comfortable in those big mountains. Um, so looking forward to seeing, seeing her come back swinging. Uh, yeah. So big, big congrats to Katie Anderson, three of the four events that we've had so far. She's found herself on the top of the podium. Yeah. Hard to argue with that. Uh, when you win three out of four, you're champ. And it's just as simple as that, um, with the math. Can't argue with the math. Anna Arlova holding down second spot. It's going to be a bit of a uh, a bit of a scrap, I think, between Anna and Estelle Rosolio for that uh, for that next spot on on the podium in the overall. As we come into Verbier, everybody you know, everybody still in the field, definitely wanting to take that that silver cup um, and not have to settle for bronze. So we'll see we'll see how it plays out when we get to when we get to the back. Absolutely. So. Uh, moving forward, the very next category that we had uh, was ski women, and things got shaken up quite a bit in this comp. Uh, it not only on the slope, but into the rankings as well. Yeah, things and people, man. People got shaken up. I mean, Molly Armanino went down with like just inside of the finish. That was such a heartbreaker. I hate to see that happen, um, where somebody is is. 90% done their run and then goes down on the last hit. Addie Rafford going down. Elizabeth Gerritsen with the crash of the year. Um, and, and I mean, I guess we might as well talk about it now. Megan Baton with the save of, I don't even know. what's Yeah, the millennia, the, the, the universe. Like, that was unbelievable what she did. She got all hung up on the track that the snowboarders put into that thing and got spun around and then shot off the cliff backwards basically nose butter brought it around just in time to land on her feet and fly off the next cliff like what it's as if she had planned it the way it was so smooth it's as if that's what she if you didn't know any better if you say you weren't a a well maybe maybe you would but if you weren't like a skier or mountain person if you're just a casual observer you possibly may have thought that was on purpose dude you would have to be a class a psycho to plan that there's like that <laughs> that was it, where it was was so gnarly and she was still exposed over two layers of, of rocks. And the fact that she managed to pull it around from switch off the first one, land on her feet and then just point it off the side. Uh, what I, it's, it doesn't even make sense. I've watched it like 500 times. And every time I watch it, I, I, it's the same reaction. I'm like, whoa, from all, from all different angles too. <laughs> yeah. The GoPro amazing. of it is, is disturbed. Like it, I, can you imagine feeling that? Like you get your, I mean, she basically well, tripped and then just save, 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 save. And oh, I guess I'm fine. And you, you can hear her curse partway through like, oh, no. And then, oh, I'm on my feet. Okay, this is good. All right, I'm good. Well, she ended up in third place overall, which is, <laughs> which even with that big bobble in the middle, it kind of shows what was happening uh, within the women's field Uh up there yeah i'd say even take it broader the ski field altogether i mean with megan getting on the podium with that is a testament to how tough it was out there when everybody else below her had you know full on 100 percent splat crashes um justine dufour lapointe was was clean um a little conservative but she was uh you know she dropped a little later and she saw the carnage and and she's a smart competitor uh, she knows exactly, like she's watching, she's she's calculating and watching crash, 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 crash. Uh, she made a smart choice to tone it down a little bit and put a clean rundown and it put her, you know, it put her on the top, or sorry, on the second step of the podium, which is a solid result, especially considering who was on the top. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, another returnee to the Free Ride World Tour, a former three-time champion, a local Austrian as well. She well, she's from Italy, but she lives in Austria. Ariana Tokomi returns to the tour, wild carded in Austria, stoked to see all her friends, stoked to be around the crew, and she does what she does, picks up right where she left off with an amazing run. Yeah, Ari, straight to the top podium. Ari's the queen of the Vilsi Loader. Uh the last time she competed on it, she won three tour overall titles in a row. Uh, and her run was cool. It was a nice blend, I thought, of of the pure free ride, the big mountain. I mean, the area that she went into at the top and the upper middle was really steep and exposed and techy, and she flowed through it super smooth. And then she, 
I was just waiting for it. You know, when's the 360 coming? It's it's a hundred percent her trademark in her comp runs, and and she pulled it. It was close. You know, her her tips actually brushed the takeoff uh, feature while she was backwards, but they were high enough that it was just a little a little pow tickle and brought it around, and boom, Ari Tricomi back on the back on the top step, right where she left off. Yeah, like right at the like she basically started off some nice high speed pace, which is key. The judges love that sort of thing. Uh, she laced that little technical zone right at the top there and then through the middle, skied some fun little pow. And then, of course, that 360 at the bottom, which I think is the only other than Megan's 360, which wasn't planned. I think that was really one of the only tricks that we saw out of the out of the um, landed tricks that we saw out of the out of the women's skiing category today. Yeah, it was a it was a tough day and I'm I'm not 100 percent sure if it was like a skis versus snowboard thing because the ski men went through the exact same, the exact same thing. Um, but definitely it was hard out there, even though the conditions were great, maybe because the conditions were great. Uh, you know, everybody just kind of tries to step it up a little bit and push a bit. And, and it's, it, it's just a testament to how difficult it is to do well on the free ride world tour when, when you, you don't know what the snow is going to be. And there were, there were pockets of glory, but there were some real tricky sections of snow as well. And and if you put a tip down or or got a foot out of place or something, like you'd you'd get slapped down pretty quick. That was the same at the Challenger event in Whistler. Is they got a really good dump of snow, um, and in a big face like that, it isn't consistent all the way top to the bottom. It would have to snow with zero wind directly down for you to have that even layer where you get into certain parts of the face where it's going to be a little wind packed, some parts of the face where it's going to have a little bit more snow deposited, some places of the face where it's going to be scoured and it may be a little firmer underneath. So as you're skiing through a run like that with fresh pow, it's a, it's a really inconsistent snow quality. It's really inconsistent snow quality. So you don't really know what you're going to get. You may have take a, take a turn and you're able to put enough pressure into your ski that you kind of get through. And then the next time you do a turn, you put in that same pressure and it is not right for that, the, that spot on the hill. Uh, so that really makes things difficult as well. I think skiing in, in a fresh pow face might be harder than uh, like a slightly hard pack or firm conditions that maybe hasn't snowed in a while. Yeah, for that inconsistency, for sure. You're just not quite sure. And especially as it gets tracked, you know, the, the snowboard categories went first. So they had the, they had the glory laps. Um, I mean, we saw it bear out with the snowboard men, like all, they just looked like they were having such a good time. And that was actually one of the, uh, one of the sort of characteristics all the way across the comp from start to finish was the riders' faces and voices when they got into the finish were just, so pumped on how much fun the runs were and and everybody you know as soon as we all got back to the hotel and the after party kind of kicked off in earnest they were just they were all buzzing on how much fun they had uh in their comp runs which is nice because it it was i mean obviously they're still nervous and scared but it's also nice to have that mental state when you're standing in the start gate of like i can't wait to do this that's that's a nice feeling uh for for the riders and i'd say they've earned it Especially after waiting a week with rain and fog and, and not knowing if you're going to be able to ski it or not. And then all of, a, all of a sudden, boom, it's that quality. That's got to be great. Yeah, so much uncertainty. So nice nice for it to pay off for, for them in the end by waiting for the end of the window. Uh, big shakeup, big, big shakeup in the ski women overall. Uh, Justine dufort Lapont jumping into the golden bib. So Maple Leafs in on top in both women's categories. But unlike snowboarding, Justine does not have it locked down. Molly Armanino and Megan Baton are, are like not even 300 points apart. Addie Rafford's just a bit back. Um, and again, with, with those huge points up for grabs in the finals, it's still, it's still pretty open. So Justine, though, she's pumped to be in that golden bib. You know, she's, she's so competitive. And obviously that's borne out with her, her World Cup and Olympic results through her mogul career. But for her to be wildcarded onto the tour and now sitting in the golden bib, she's kind of like, uh, the plan is all coming together. And it's, it's cool to see like after she's like, I, I'm never taking this off. I'm not giving it back. Yeah. And that's, that's a, that's a scary mindset for her, for her competitors to, to, to know about. Uh, Cause she, that's what she's done her whole life. She is a career competitor. Um, 
and she's brought it here. And it seems, I don't know if it's really seemed to be bringing up the level of the others. I think she's just such a, a light, happy go lucky kind of really friendly, outgoing, bubbly person that you don't really see the eye of the tiger, (laughs) which is kind of just below the surface. Totally. It's almost like a trick. You know, she's not, she's not ruthless. She's, she's not like, out there mean mugging at the other competitors. Like she's lovely to be around, but it's, it's in that moment when, you know, when she, she clicks into her skis and pushes out of the start gate. Uh, that's, that's when you see it. And she's got a history of performing when it counts of rising to the big moments. So I, I certainly wouldn't be betting against her. No, absolutely not. And I'm just doing a few calculations here and the numbers separating the top three is only 305 points. And then even Addison Rafford is pretty much right there as well. Like she's just just over 500 points uh, behind Megan Batan. Um, one of the things I, I did notice on the comp was uh, Addie, uh, she, had, um, she had a little bit of a, a compression before the takeoff on her air. She kind of got bucked off in her air, which caused her to crash. Um, didn't lose his ski, but got out and pretty much just skied out to the bottom. And I know we've talked about this in the past as well. Um, in the, in the event itself, I think she got a 15 point score. Molly, who also crashed, got a 29.67. Now, knowing what happened in the past with Elizabeth Gerritsen and Hedvig Vessel and that 20 point difference a couple of years ago, do you think Addison should have found some more things to do in order to gain a few more points and would she have been able to make up that extra 15 points on that run to potentially put her ahead of molly which would have put her ahead of mcgann and potentially even ahead of molly in the overall uh I, look in a perfect world sure that strategically that's a that's a, a stronger move um but you can't underestimate what it does to you mentally when you fall right up at the top. I mean, that was basically her first hit. Um, and it was, it was a rough one. Like she got tossed on that. Cause she, like you said, she got a little bit buffed on the in run and then she kind of got shot off it instead of going up. She went really out and she was super backseat on the takeoff. Um, so I I don't, I don't blame her for, for just kind of calling it a day at that point. Uh, but yes, you strategically it's, it makes sense bring the score back up a little bit um, and, and don't put yourself in that position where, where your, your possible uh, fellow competitor who also falls is, is ahead of you. But I, I just, it's a hard one to say after the fact you should have done this or you should have done that because who knows what's going through your head at that, at that moment. And the last thing you want to see, and this is why in, you know, in junior comps, they always say to not do it is you have a fall, you're totally rattled, you go send something out of rage or frustration or whatever, and then you end up getting hurt. Um, so it's a, it's a tough one. Strategically, it's better. Possibly in the moment, mentally, what she did was was the right move. Uh, and either way, it's it's done and dusted, so that's what happened. But yeah, you're totally right. And from a from a sort of perspective of, of looking at the big picture, that's probably the better strategy call, the tactical call. Uh, but who, who's to say what, how easy exactly. that is to do it in the moment. Exactly. Who's to know, like, maybe she hurt herself. She's like, I just need to get to the bottom, uh, and get, and get, you know, maybe she winded herself or maybe she's sore. She's like, I, I just got to get out of here. And you know, a lot of those riders, when they have done things like look at Cody, uh, in the first event of the season, he ended up breaking his ankle. Yeah. And, and he, adrenaline carries him oh, through. Sorry, se- second event of the season broke his ankle and he just rode out. He's like, I'm not going to let somebody take me out of here. I'm not getting on a toboggan. I'm not getting in the heli. I'm just going to ride to the bottom and deal with it. So there's a lot of pride within there as well. But also, like you said, adrenaline running. You don't. You, sometimes you got to wait for it to wear off to find out <laughs> what hurts and how severe it hurts. Totally. And I'm sure Addison doesn't care what a couple dudes on the couch are saying she should have done either. I mean, she's a rock star and she'll be, she'll be coming back with the, with the fighting spirit that we know her for in the next one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, a couple, couple of dudes on the couch. That should be. We should make a sticker. <laughs> Our armchair free riders. All right. Well, the uh, close out of the day 
And another tough day at the office for a lot of people, ski men. Um, more than 50% of the field going down out there. And and some some people that I definitely expected to see on the podium as well. You know, I'm, I'm looking at the bottom of the result sheet. Finn Billis, Marcus Gogan, Max Palm, Simon Peridon, Carl Regner, Erickson. Like heavy, heavy hitters, just boom, 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 one after another, crash, 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 crash. It was it was tough out there for the ski guys. And it's 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 amazing because you look at that and those are the bottom of the list. Like the whole list are heady, heavy hitters. But I will say, let's give it up for A Paul. He's very humble. He does it. He always he, he always makes those comments like, "Oh, I don't know. I'm not going to be here. I'm not making the cut." Or these guys are crazy. What am I doing here? Well, you're obviously doing something right because not only did you win this event with smart skiing, he's also sitting third overall in the standings. Yeah, Apol nailed it, and I think maybe more than well, actually no, uh, similar to a lot of the other winning riders today, uh, experience really paid off. The full-on reckless send was maybe not on the menu today for for successful runs. You know, John Pow, bit of an older rider, bit more experienced. He's been around the block. He knows. He knows how to do it. Katie Anderson, she's relatively new on the tour, but she's also got that whole career in World Cup border cross where it's kind of no one to hold them and no one to fold them in, in the right moments. Uh, Ari Chikomi, hard-pressed to find somebody with more experience and a better track record on this on this face. And A-Paul was exactly the same. He was so smart. His run was sick. Like, let's not, let's not say that he, you know, he half-assed it. It was really good, but it was still, um, it was like, he read the face, recognized that a bunch of the usual, the usual features that play really well were either too flat or too big, and he took things off at slightly different angles as A. Paul does. You know, he he sees the he sees the art in it, and man, it worked to a T. The guy's on the top of the podium; he's got a win, and like you said, now he's in the podium conversation for the overall. All in he's, one day. He's not even in the podium conversation. He's on the overall podium conversation. Like he skied to the conditions. Uh, I ended up having a little conversation with him. So let's see what he had to say about uh, his day on the face. Andrew Pollard, congratulations on taking the top step for Feberbren. How you feeling, my man? Uh, I'm excited. Yeah, stoked to... To ski and have a good time in the mountains with some good friends. Happy to do it. I, I love that you're just so just happy to ride. To me, it seems like competition really isn't like the number one goal, even though you're on like a competitive world tour. I've always got the vibe that comp- comp- competition really isn't your jam, but you just like doing it and being around your friends. Is that a fair assessment? It is, but I mean, I'm super competitive still. But a lot of times in competition, I get too scared to do what I realistically want to, but it normally keeps me safe and on my feet. And that's what worked today because, I mean, a lot of those kids were definitely pushing harder than what I was doing, but they all had bobbles. So it's a game and yes, yeah, sometimes playing the game works. Well, obviously, um, but- Touching on what you just brought up, I think more than half of the, the the men's category ended up having crashes today. Was that like a snow thing? I know that the snow conditions were had changed a lot over the week with that new snow. Was that you think what came into play? Or were people just giving her too hard, fired up about you know making the cut and trying to get a little higher up on the on the podium list or on the on the results sheet? I think a lot of what's actually been going on on tour this year is a lot of kids. There are all a lot of young kids this year on tour, and it's interesting to see a lot of them be freaked out about what other people are going to do and thinking that they have to push it really hard. Like, if a lot of those kids would have toned it down just like and skied at 85% of what they can do, it totally beats me every time. Like, those kids are freaking good now. But I think a lot of times when you get them all pent up together, they get this idea that they have to go bigger than they should. When I think a lot of those kids could have kept it mellower and the show would have actually been better. And I would have done as well. I don't know. I think I I think I might have to agree with you a little bit. Some of them, yeah, I think what you just said, a lot of them will really, really go for it. Whereas you have that, you know, veteran 
the veteran experience and you know how you want to ski as well. Like you, you always ski within your limits. You always look super smooth, but super comfortable as well. Um, and it showed in today's run. Uh, would you mind kind of walking us through the run top to bottom? If you can remember a lot of it. Uh, basically I thought that I was going to, I was going back and forth between the Eagle and the Housel for a while. And after Elizabeth crashed in the, Eagle Valet broke his thumb potentially before the comp and he was looking at the Eagle too. So I kind of essentially decided the Eagle was kind of weird vibes and I was like, well, I, I've skied that line that I skied today like four other times here. <clears throat> so it wasn't like it was anything that was super gnarly or new. So I kind of just rolled into it and skied it was like, I'll just take everything as it comes and try and ski it a little bit better than I have in the past. A lot of times I've like skipped features at the bottom. So I just tried to link everything up. I don't know. Yeah, and it, it yeah, definitely worked. I think being able to go from feature to feature to feature definitely brought your, your line score a bit. But you, your whole run with one little minor, little looked like you got a little bog going in into the wind lip. Definitely got swooped off the wind lip. But I was planning to go that same way at the same time. I just wanted to jump off the wind lip before I did it. So, right, and then uh, sorry, no wind lip air. <laughs> uh, the the three sixty was super smooth. Um, both of them. Uh, was it a I've done one or two of them? Was it was it a spraffy? Was it a spread eagle? What was it? Derek called it a spraffy. A, I've always been in the splaffy. S P L A F F Y. The Splaffy. I don't know where it comes from, but I think Spraffy's kind of sounds whack. It's a Splaffy. <laughs> the, spl the Splaffy. Well, it was a, it was super fun to watch and super smooth. Classic uh, Andrew Pollard style. You know, Derek and I talk a lot about you have a real like east to west kind of skiing style where you are able to like flow to feature and then make it to another feature, but make it look fun, make it look interesting rather than a straight, you know, north south vertical line down the face you're looking for things to do you're looking for fun features you're looking for transitions that's kind of your style and it looked exactly classic a paul run today and landed you on top so congratulations yeah thanks dog stoked if it's not fun don't hit it yeah that's good and i hope i'm hoping some of these uh young guns might come and start picking your brain a little bit more i know they do already no they do for sure and they did also, like, but I know, yeah, it's interesting. They just want to push yeah. really hard, which it works nine out of ten times, and then sometimes it doesn't work, and then Andrew wins. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, the, it's like uh, the tortoise and the hare. It is literally the tortoise and the hare, for sure. It's me, I'm the tortoise, and there's a lot of hares on tour. So as you were saying, uh, experience and uh, experience experiences is, is a huge factor. Um, and it was, uh, I think, more of a mental game this week. You know, a lot of those big names that we were talking about have gotten there because they can do spectacular things on their skis. But the Feberbrunn event didn't call for spectacular things. It called for more strategy and being able to ski to conditions. Yeah, and maybe the the one exception to that rule was our silver medalist today, Maxime Chablot. That was a spectacular run with a pretty big blemish in the middle of it. Um, he was one of the only guys like Liam Rivera to really figure out that that George Rodney, Marcus Eder uh, flip jump up at the top that took out so many people. He went, I don't know, seven kilometers further than everyone else and found another transition down there. And his stomp, I mean, he won the Scott stomp of the day. He, he, it was perfect, perfect landing. And that one just absolutely mowed people down all day long. Um, and then got just so wonky on a 360 and kind of slide flopped and then went down and did a, a cork seven off another cliff. Like it was, it was a weird sandwich, you know, a delicious bread, but the stuff in the middle was gross. Um, but <laughs> the judges, you know, they, they rewarded it because what he did, it was, I guess, a little, a little like Marcus Gogan a few comps ago in, in Ordino, where there was enough great 
to to bring up the part that wasn't so great with that with that big bobble. But I mean, to end up in second place with that is uh, is is a pretty big testament to the rest of of Maxime's run. And I have never ever ever seen him ski so wild that was like holding on by his fingernails for the whole run but just it just kept working oh yeah the note i wrote at the top uh, of his of his next to his name was adventurous in all caps (laughs) 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 that's exactly what it was talking about that i think your quote to get back to some Derek quotes which we've missed uh talking about his run you were like this in his run the thing that wasn't clean wasn't but the thing that was was, <laughs> yeah, I st- I stand behind that one all day. It was it was it was spectacular, and and that that uh, otherwise with that blemish, I mean, that would have been a winning run for sure. Um, but you, you got to be clean top to bottom. That's what the judges want, and and that's what their criteria demands. So he didn't quite have it, but he still got himself uh, he still got himself a, a really good finish up there, and has brought himself super close to Valley now in the overall. Yeah, absolutely, and you know. He had an 84.33, Andrew had an 86 point on the day. And in this era of the Freeride World Tour, to not have a ski men in the 90s um, is pretty shocking. Yeah, I'd say there was a couple, you know, before we, before we get to Oscar and, and his podium run, I'd say there were a couple that would have been in the 90s had they gone fully to plan. Max Hitzig and Maxime Chablot are the two that really stand out to me. Um, and then, you know, there's guys like Max Palm and Marcus Gogan down, down in the, in the crash, uh, zone where it's really hard to know where those ones would have scored. We know they're capable of, of 90 plus point runs, but we did just, you know, barely got going and then they were down. So, um, but yeah, he had that massive 360 before the housel. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And he's one of the only guys that was able to, to pace that wind lip after the puzzle that didn't get stuck on it yeah yeah exactly and that's that's just raw carl regner pace i mean he just skis so fast um but i do want to talk about oscar mandan because this this guy has been he's kind of hot and cold you know he'll have a uh, he's on the podium and then off with a couple of well a crash and then he had that horrible luck skiing into the avi debris in kicking horse and blowing up and then now he's back on the podium um, and his run was cool. He really stuck over onto the left side and it was pretty interesting to me because very, very similar run to what we saw from Abel Moga who won the challenger comp after the FWT finished. Uh, they had a real similar take on the face, pretty much all the same features. I think the main difference was Oscar backflipped the cliff that took Carl out and, and sat Hitzig down, uh, where Abel did a 360 off it, but otherwise really, really similar. And, Great skiing, great skiing from Oscar Mandan. And he's, you know, he's bumped himself up again after a couple of tough ones to be able to to be resilient enough to to put it back together and and get himself on the podium again. Rookie, and he's already been on the podium twice. He, he, that's nothing to sneeze at. No, and he could have been on the podium more times. And I think, you know, to touch on what you're talking about, I think a lot of those are just learning experiences that you have to go through when you're a rookie. So a couple of those... Like the like the the kicking horse event that was kind of a I don't know if I, you said it was luck I don't know if I would call it hundred percent luck because that was a choice to go kind of in that zone as well um, but it's really cool to kind of see him figure things out and evolve and have such success as a rookie as well yeah he's a real student of the sport and and he did say that after um, that you know he spent a lot of time on the qualifiers more than a lot of other people have. And he said he is learning every single comp run he does. He's learning. He's filing those those learnings away and trying to make sure that he never makes the same mistake twice. Uh, and it's really paying off for him. That that sort of studious mentality is it, it's working out because he's he's got a couple podiums under his belt now in his rookie season. Obviously, he's in the finals, and you know he's collecting some hardware on the free ride world tour, and that's. That's pretty impressive. Uh, a couple other you know, notables, Max Palm, 360 into a new zone. Uh, he unfortunately had a crash, but we did get another beauty Derek, Derekism out of it. Um, he's going to be about as happy as a cat in a bath about that one. <laughs> I, was laugh- I was laughing out loud. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Max. He definitely takes he takes it hard. He doesn't like to he doesn't like to fall. He doesn't like to lose. 
Um, so he was definitely not, not pleased. You could see it, you know, when he was hiking for his ski, the emotions are, were pretty raw. Um, and, and that's, that's as it should be. These athletes care if they didn't care, um, they wouldn't be so engaging. And, and I'm, I'm all about that. Like they, they're passionate. You gotta be a competitor in order to do something like this. You gotta have that competitive spirit. And when a competitor doesn't do what they expect of themselves, they get pissed off. And yeah. that is fair. That's what gets them to where that gets them is that unwavering. It's that un- inability to compromise from your goals. I need to win. Anything less than winning is unacceptable. And of course, just to clarify, I was laughing at you. I wasn't laughing at Max. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of unwavering, how about Max Hitzig? pioneering a brand new air on this face that's been 14 years on the free ride world tour um into that antimatin entrance and then airing over the entire couloir to the perfect transition i mean that transition was about as long as his skis are and he nailed it and i mean i'm sure you guys have seen the gopro footage like his pov of it it's so far across and so far down. So to have the wherewithal to take the speed into it that you need, because it was quite a long way. Um, oh, I, I was watching and I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, yeah, he's over, he's over, he's over. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was so perfectly executed. And, and like I said, just the scoping of it, to be able to see that, recognize that, that it goes, and then do it in, in – in the way with such precision that you could just land like you were stepping off, stepping off a curb. I mean, I know that Max is a really, really strong guy, um, but he just made it look like he barely connected with the ground. It was just effortless. So nice to see. But I actually talked to him after and was like, I didn't know you could fall. And he was kind of like hilariously relieved. He's like, ah, it's been a long time and I feel like it's good to get it out of the way. And I was like, wow, that's such a great, mindset after having what was you know looking to be who who knows if it would have won but it was a great run going and for him to just shake it off like that and be like yeah you know it didn't work out and I'm kind of glad to get a fall out of the way so now I don't have to crash again (laughs) it was it was cool it was a good look into his psyche and what makes him tick yeah uh, affectionately starting to be called the free ride robot Max Hitzig so uh, let's give a little overview of the rankings, the current standings uh, for ski men. And I will tell you that between first and sixth place, it's 5,200 points. That's it. Valley Rayner is at the top of the podium, which is really exciting for him being, uh, as we mentioned earlier in the season, coming from the Challenger Tour. He's had a lot going on this season and is skiing really well. Maxime Chablot, who ends up still collecting huge points on a couple events, even with a few bobbles. Uh, he's in second. And then Andrew Pollard, a uh, smooth, stylish, but also smart skiing, puts him in third. Yeah, it's exciting. I mean, it really is going to come down to the last event of the season, the the grand final in in Verbier for for this category. I mean, it's all so so close all the way back. And as you said, there's there's three thousand points in it, down to fifth or sixth, and and twelve thousand five hundred available for a win in these finals events. So it's gonna be it's gonna be really exciting to see who's who's gonna step into the pressure, who's gonna step up to the fear on the Bec de Ross and and perform and and bring it because. As you said, when we were talking about the the crashing of the field, all the way down to to the guy who's sitting in in the eleventh spot right now, they can all do it. Um, whose day is it? Who's going to choose the right line? Who's going to ski to the conditions? Who's going to risk it and really put their you know put their put their full dream line down? Uh, it's there's so much to play for still. And there's no clear favorite, at least in my eyes, which is the best to, to have, be going into the last event with it with it all this close. No, fully wide open. Someone could like someone or half the field could crash again, and someone just happens to put down the greatest run of the day. They could find themselves with the championship trophy. So it's really, really, really up for grabs, uh, which is. I think this is one of the closest races we've had in a long time. Yeah, I think I think so too. And and it's pretty 
exciting that, you know, what I'm really hoping for the, the dream free ride day, uh, where the stomped run ratio is a little different than what we saw in Feverburn and we see everybody clean and then really make the judges figure it out because that's what, I mean, that's what everybody wants. Everyone wants to see their competitors put down their best run as well and then see how it shakes out versus like, yeah, you know, even a Paul said it, he was like, well, I won, but they all crashed. And I was like, dude, but you didn't. So that, <laughs> you know, don't, don't underweigh that or undervalue it. It matters like to not crash. Um, but I do love the days when, when nobody crashes and then it's just there because they're so skilled and across all four categories, when, when it goes like that, it's just such a pleasure to watch and be around. It looks like that wraps up the fever burn event. I think we covered most of what we should have gotten to anything else that kind of sticks out in your mind. Well, we, we, unfortunately, as much as I don't want to, we got to mention our, our peak performance fun bet standings. You and I are <laughs> in the sewer. We're circling the drain here. Um, I swear I put my, I put my picks in and it didn't go through. Maybe I just didn't hit send or, or, you know, I blew it somehow, but, uh, it's, we are not doing well in the peak performance fun bet. So I'm proud of all of you out there in our FWT podcast league that are smoking us. That's, that's great. And well, great for you, bad for us and making us look even worse than we actually are. Well, I like to chalk it up to this as we talk so much about the, the tour is maybe we just overthink, maybe we think we know more, maybe we just overthink it and we just assume, but also I find that maybe we have thoughts about like, I don't know, maybe we know a little bit too much rather than just, (laughs) That's what I'm going to say. Maybe we know too much and we're overthinking things. Uh, out of the peak performance uh, FWT uh, Fun Bet League, which if you're listening, you can still join. You don't have to be for the whole season. You can join just for an event. Uh, we want you to join in. I think we've got about 34 or 35 people uh, in the FWT Podcast Fun Bet League. Uh, I believe you're currently sitting in 20th place, Derek. And I am. I am currently sitting in 21st place, uh, and I'm actually kind of happy that you didn't get your, your numbers in because I missed the kicking horse numbers because I actually passed out the night before, and I missed Oof. I, I missed it. I wasn't able to put them in. Um, this week, I did terribly uh, once again. Uh, but you know what? That's, uh, that's how it rolls. That's how the cookie crumbles. That's, uh, that, what's, that's, that is what makes it fun, I think, is... Um, you know, being able to think you know what you want and being able to put your money where your mouth is. And with the Peak Performance Fun Bet, uh, the overall winner is going to get 3,000 euros in Peak Performance swag, and there are prizes for every individual event. Uh, yeah, thirty currently 35 members in the FWT Podcast League. It says I'm sitting in 17th at the top, uh, but when I actually go into it, I think it says 21st overall. But that's all right. Uh, let's give a shout out to the people in first place, though. We got Spawn, I think he's been up there for a little while. In first, in second place, a guy named E Winner. Um, and then uh, Telemarker. That's his name, Telemarker, in third place. Uh, so that's the top three. And, um, you know, hopefully you and I can do a little bit better next week and kind of make some points up. Um, but I had another. Pretty, pretty subpar week. I thought it was going to be a little easier considering the uh, field was smaller, um, but I was horribly wrong. Yeah, well, we'll we'll try again. We'll get redemption in Verbier. It's coming up uh, where I'm currently in Verbier. The the crew is out there starting to, to take a look at the face, doing assessments, figuring out snowpack and snow conditions, where the starts are going to be and all those things that, that go on behind the scenes before – uh, the riders even arrive in town, so all the pieces are moving and and the balls are rolling and the plates are spinning and and we're getting ready to to kick this this final free ride world tour event of the season off. It's coming so fast. I can't believe we're almost we're almost at the last one. It feels like we just got started, but it's it's super exciting. Like all four categories are tight, except for obviously snowboard women, which is wrapped up. But now the battle for second is super close. So. It's going to be exciting. I'm sure there's going to be some some big wild card announcements coming in in the upcoming days. So there'll be some fear struck into the hearts of the riders as as some some big dogs come into the you know back into the yard and and uh, see 
see what they can do, what kind of damage they can wreak on the field. But we'll leave those announcements to the FWT comms team. Um, I don't know yet. I'm just making wild assumptions here, but I betcha. <laughs> well, I will be there in about four days. I'm flying over. And uh, I do know that there is some snow in the forecast uh, for Verbier. Um, the weather window is uh, about five days from now. Uh, like it's the day after I arrive, I believe the Thursday. Um, so we'll kind of see what this incoming snow does, uh, and when the, the comp will be able to be held. Uh, but it'll definitely do wonders, uh, for the face, refreshing it and uh, making it aesthetically pleasing, um, for the cameras once we get it going. Yeah. And I can tell you that the nerves are already kicking in for the riders. The Beck de Ross is truly its own beast. And it, it strikes fear into even the gnarliest uh, pro free riders. And, and they're already getting the, the sweaty palms, you know, just thinking about what it's going to feel like to stand in the start gate on that one. Well, we'll just have to wait and see. It's coming up soon. Uh, thanks, Derek, for uh, connecting with me. I, uh, I know we've been trying to figure out the, uh, the technical aspects of the remote episodes. I hope you folks enjoyed this one as well, as I always do. Uh, please make sure that you're subscribed to the Free Ride World Tour podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you just happen to be coming across it, make sure you give us a subscribe. And please give us a review. We really love talking about this. We'd love to hear your feedback. We'd love to get a good review if you think it's warranted. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in to find out about what's happening in the world of free ride. And uh, from myself and from Derek, we will talk to you guys next week. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, buddy. See you soon. This has been a Redmark Media production.